Well, good morning, beautiful people. You are a beautiful people. I'm not just saying that. You do look really good today. That group that was in here last week it was a little rough. But I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just trying to make sure you're still with me today. Uh, like Mandy said, my name is Gino Allison. I'm one of the pastors here. And I want to welcome you, as always, to the South Suburban Vineyard Church. You could be anywhere this morning. You probably passed a few dozen churches on your way here, and so it's not lost on us the significance of you being with us today. So thank you. Special welcome also to those of us, for those of you who are visiting with us for the first time, so glad to have you here with us. And as always, those of you who are watching us online, we're so grateful to have you here, whether you're watching us live or on demand. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Well, I have the privilege of continuing a teaching series that we started just a few weeks ago, a series that we're simply calling Christmas Presents. Yes. Christmas presents, and so far we've been talking about the importance of presents. We've been extolling the value and virtue of not presents with T-S on the end, but presents, whether in our human relationships or in our spiritual life with Jesus, we are to place a high value, dare I say a higher value, on the gift of presents because we believe that the best gift that has ever been given or received is the gift of presence. And it's a fitting series as we enter the third week of the Advent season, a season observed by Christians all over the world that uh, thanks uh, thanks God for Christ's first coming, we prepare for a second coming during Advent, and we celebrate his presence among us today, choosing intentionally to center Christ and all the things that he brings, knowing that there are plenty of things that will compete for our attention and our affection. During this holiday season, we intentionally center Christ, particularly and his presence. And the goal of this series, as we've gone through week by week, is to explore how this idea of presence impacts our relationship with God and it impacts our relationships with others this holiday season and beyond. And so the first week we began by talking about the importance and significance of Emmanuel, which simply means God with us. God's presence has come, as the scripture says, and moved into our neighborhood. God's presence is here. And we're to invite him, to make room for him, and to center Emmanuel in our life. Last week, we talked about the importance of stewarding the presence, how we got to show up, how we got to stay ready, how we got to receive and respond to the presence, right? And so, so far, we've talked about God is present to us and with us. We continued by talking about how we should be present to God, how we should steward that presence And this week, I want to continue by talking about how we should be present to others. How we should be present to others, other people. How we should be present in general to the world around us. To put it a different way, how we should be showing up in the world, having been influenced and impacted by God's presence, the indwelling presence that lives within us and informs how we live our life, that should inform how we show up in the world, right? So I'm continuing this series with a message that I'm simply calling, Be the Presence. Be the Presence. I want to be in a passage of scripture this morning, Matthew chapter 5. Would you meet me there in your Bibles today? Matthew chapter 5. I want to start at verse 13. Be the presence. There are Bibles on the edges of your rows. Feel free to use those if you want to interact with the text. You can also use your devices if you like, but we'll also be projecting it on the screens while you find that. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. Let me pray for our time today. Heavenly Father, we invite your presence here. We know you're here, and we want you to know that you're welcome to move, to speak, and do whatever you want to do today. Emmanuel, we thank you for your presence among us. And we ask, Lord, that you would show us in ways that we can carry out of this room with us today and put into practice how we are to show up in the world around us in a way that you would be pleased with, in a way that you would be satisfied with, in a way that would make you smile. Come, Holy Spirit, put power on these words you've given me to speak. Move the preacher out of the way this morning so that your truth and your Light might shine through. May the book come alive to us today. We ask all these things in the strong name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16. This is Jesus talking to his disciples. He says, you are the salt of the earth. 
What good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. Verse 14, you are the light of the world. Like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden, no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. This is the word of the Lord. Now, some of you might be wondering, that's a cool text and everything, Pastor, but what on earth, Reverend, does that have to do with Christmas? What on earth does that have to do with the Advent season? My simple answer is it has to do a whole lot with the Christmas season. It has to do a whole lot with Advent if you have eyes to see it. Christ came to earth, after all, he moved into our neighborhood. Emmanuel came to dwell among us to, among other things, change the world. The world was in trouble, folks were down here acting a fool, and Christ came to change the world. And this passage and others like it should be read, among other things, as an invitation. You say an invitation into what? An invitation to partner with Jesus in doing that important, necessary work of changing the world. I'll say this again. This passage and others like it, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them, right? I'm going to be with you while you do it. That's an invitation to partner with Jesus in this whole changing the world business. Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will be my witnesses here, near and far away. What is he inviting us to? To partner with him in the very important and necessary work of changing the world. What's interesting is that Almighty God, who spoke to nothing and created everything that we, we see and experience today, could very easily do it by himself. He could do it by himself. And yet, he allows us, instructs us, welcomes us, challenges us, and in some ways commands us to partner with him to change the world. To fix that which is broken, obviously broken, in the world we live in. This is an invitation. And in these short verses, I see at least three things that stand out, three challenges, if you will, that leaf off the page to me, and I want to share them with you uh, as we're challenged to be the presence. And so among other things, Jesus is challenging us to first live the blessed life, to live the blessed life. Now, some of you sit up in your seats, you're like, I could, I could, I could go for that. I was just praying that some blessings would rain down this morning, so preacher, talk that talk to me today. But don't get too excited because the blessed life is it might not be what you think it is. And some of you hear the blessed life or the good life as we talk about it, you think about wealth, you think about ease, I can finally quit this job and just relax. You think about maybe popularity or fame some measure of comfort, some measure of doors opening for you or cooler opportunities. I need some more money, Lord, bless me. I want a job that I like going to, Lord, bless me. I want to be adored and celebrated. I want to feel good and I want to look good while I feel good. Is that what you're talking about, preacher? I hate to break it to you. But this isn't the life that Jesus has invited us into. You see, this salt and light passage is situated in an interesting and essential portion of Scripture known to many Christians as the Sermon on the Mount. It's contained in Matthew 5, 6, and 7, and it spans a number of subjects, subjects that we would consider essential Christian truths, some of the basics for living the Christian life. And the 12 verses that precede the three verses that we read today set up nicely what Jesus is inviting us into. It really sets the stage. It zooms out and give us, gives us a broader picture of just what Jesus is inviting us into 
as we are challenged to be the presence, not to just contain the presence, not to just enjoy the presence, but to be the presence. Be an agent of the kingdom coming in somebody's life. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12 create a great runway to what we're talking about today, and I'm going to read them because they're that important. Verse 1, one day, as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. He's going to be there for a while. His disciples gathered around him, and he began to teach them. Teach them about what? About the blessed life. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. So that's interesting. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it. Be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. Some of you have said, what version of the Bible is that? That's not the blessed life I was praying for this morning. This sets up the whole salt and light passage. This sets up this faithful ancient but relevant discourse on how we are to be every day as we go about being agents of kingdom change in our little slices of the life that we've been given to steward. Jesus is describing here the blessed life, the good life. And you don't have to read but a few verses to understand that this is not a ride on the up escalator of life. This isn't the American dream lived out, the American ideal lived out. This is something different. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. To put it a different way, blessed are those who don't think they're all that, who know they aren't all that. Blessed are those who are poor enough in spirit to recognize their need for a savior. That's the life that God blesses. Blessed are those who mourn about the tragedies in their own life and show up and mourn with other people. This is, this is a slow ride on the what? On the down escalate. But this is the life that God blesses. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness and justice. Put a different way. Blessed are those who give their life to lifting up those who are underneath. Blessed are those who are too self-absorbed, who who aren't too wrapped up in benefiting from the systems of supremacy and oppression and racism and sexism and all the other isms. Blessed are those who don't benefit enough from those those systems to, to take themselves out of dismantling those systems. Blessed are those. This is the down escalator. Blessed are those who are merciful, those who refuse to get even, even when they can Blessed are those who work, work for peace. Often in our house, burst into the room, my kids are arguing. I don't try to adjudicate the matter. I said, look, work for peace. Which means that the easiest thing to do is to fight for your own way. The easiest thing, the lazy thing is to stand your ground. But if you want peace, it takes work. It takes sacrifice. Work for priests. Blessed are those who are persecuted and slandered and and, and folk don't want to see you coming, not because you're a jerk, but because of what you stand for. This is the blessed life. Who wants it? That's like three hands out of... Somebody just closed the laptop on the live stream. They're finished. (laughs) This is the blessed life. What's more is Jesus is describing himself. This is Emmanuel. This is what he come to do. To be humble and to model 
humility, to be our eternal answer, our eternal example. This is what he come to do. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. He's describing himself because we are to be an outworking of his presence here on earth. He's describing himself. And what does Jesus know that sometimes we lose sight of? What, is he, what does he know that we haven't yet laid a hold of in, in, in a permanent way? What he knows is that when you live this kind of life, your presence will be felt wherever you go. If you did a third of the things on the Beatitudes list, you will show up as radically different in any room you go to, even in the church. Let me say that again. What Jesus knows is that if you show up this way, you will stand out. Because the world around us doesn't aspire to these things. In the glossary of how the world defines the good life, this isn't the definition. This isn't the prescription. And what Jesus knows is if you show up this way, you will be different. You will be peculiar. And for some of you, the last thing you want to do is stand out. The last thing you want to be is different. But you must if you're gonna be the presence. Which brings me to the second thing, the second challenge I feel that Jesus offers us, he, he challenges us to be a noticeable presence. A noticeable presence. You are the salt of the earth, he says, but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worth it, worthless. Verse 14, you are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. What is our Lord and Savior saying to us? Your Christian faith should be the worst kept secret in your life. Your Christian faith, your spiritual life with Jesus, that's supposed to touch every meaningful area of your life, should be the worst kept secret. But sadly, for many of us, not. Now, we know people who, like, who, who are trying to keep a secret, but they're really bad at it. Like those people that are dating at work, they don't think anybody knows, but like everybody knows that they're together. Y'all leave at the same time, come back from lunch, looking disheveled. We know. <laughs> the words kept secret. And I think what Jesus might be saying to us is that our Christian faith and the outworking of that faith should be hard to miss. But sadly for many of us, it is. Missable, that is. Because we show up differently in different rooms. Our faith can be, as a survival instinct, situational. Dare I say it, circumstantial. We get to doing all kinds of Christians code switching. You need to be Christian around Christian folks. But how you show up in the marketplace, how you show up at work, how you show up at school, how you show up with your good time buddies. It should be the worst kept secret. And Jesus says to us in Matthew chapter 3, verse 12, how we live our life, how we show up radically different in the world should make us stand out. You are the salt of the earth. Salt to us is like basically food seasoning. And that application alone just sort of works because if you ever had some food that didn't have adequate seasoning, well, 
My wife and I are from different culture, you know, so we, we approach seasoning a little bit differently. She said, baby, taste this. I said, baby, this is delicious. I said, the flavors just come out, but it, it needs a little, a little something. And she might say to me, this is good, but it's a little salty for me, right? So it's important. It's an important cultural, culinary element, but to the original listeners, they would have heard so much more than just a seasoning, right? In the days before refrigeration, salt was a preserving element. It, it, it kept meat. It preserved meat. Salt was a highly valued commodity in the ancient world. It was, it was at one point a part of the general currency, especially in Rome. In fact, have you ever heard the expression, he wasn't worth his salt or he wasn't worth his pay? Salt was a valuable commodity in the ancient world. And the disciples would have heard and understood the significance and weight of Jesus is likening them to such a valuable commodity. Why? Because salt is a difference maker. You know when it's there. And you know when it's not. Now, Jesus likes to really make the point, so he, 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 he takes it deeper. He says, you are the light of the world. And like salt, light's another thing that modern-day folks like us generally take for granted because we have lights everywhere. Nighttime means nothing to us because of the prevalence of light. This was not so in the ancient world. The roadways were not lined with street lights. The houses and cities were not equipped with indoor electricity. And because it was so dark outside, when anyone lit a lamp, it could be easily seen, even from great distances. It's also important to note that most of the cities and vi villages were situated on hilltops. So when a person or a group was traveling, they could see that light because of the darkness. They could see that light from a long way off. On top of all of this, this distinction of being lights of the world had been previously given by the Jews to certain of their eminent rabbis, right? Really important, smart, holy men were often referred to as lamps of the universe. But Jesus was talking to his disciples, base, common men, nothing really special about these cats, and yet Jesus was calling them lamps of the universe. Lights of the world, and because he was talking to his disciples, he was also talking to us. He's calling us lights of the world. To be called light is no small thing because light has an unmistakable presence. And when light shows up, it doesn't take away the darkness, it just takes it over. Which means that when the light chooses not to show up, or when we choose to light our, hide our light up under a bushel, the darkness is still there. And we don't remove darkness. We impose the light of Jesus. And so this is the point that Jesus is making. Salt and light is an unmistakable presence, and Jesus is instructing us to have a noticeable presence in the world wherever we go because of what we carry because of who we represent. Jesus had a noticeable presence wherever he went. Whether he was in the synagogue, people knew Jesus was in here. Whether he was in the marketplace, whether he went to a party and they needed some more wine, they knew Jesus was in the building. And I wonder if, if we have a noticeable presence. And folks notice that you have entered the room. Let's sit with that for a second. And this is an important question because in this particular cultural climate, uh, the, the, the teachings of Jesus, the exclusiveness that is involved in Christian faith is, is, is patently offensive, right? And so we can learn to blend in. We can, we can learn and even sort of church it up to value not making any, any, any waves. But I don't think that's the way of Christ. I, I don't think that's the way of Christ. I was listening to a podcast recently and somebody said uh, um, that they want their company or their business to be a, a painkiller and, and not a vitamin. 
You take a vitamin, you don't know what you're getting, right? Like you could be eating a fruit snack. You don't know. But if you take a painkiller, you're going to know within a matter of minutes if the painkiller is, is worth its salt, to use the expression. Because it has a noticeable presence because it pushes back that which is unpleasant and dark. You understand what I'm saying? I'm talking about a noticeable presence. But I think it's important and necessary to round this out with our third challenge that I think this text issue is our presence shouldn't just be noticeable, but it should be a helpful presence. Somebody say helpful. It should be a helpful presence because some of you have a noticeable presence. Oh, people notice. But I don't know how helpful it is. I don't know how tethered it is to Jesus' qualities and all the Beatitudes that we read about just moments ago, it's important that we have a helpful presence. I'm talking about the difference between a good amount of salt on a perfectly cooked dish versus salt on my lawn. Now every spring we gotta plant new grass right here because when the salt guys come through, they just kinda throw that salt and as it gets along the edge of the grass, it's not having a good impact on my grass. Pastor David's got to get out there and he's got to plant some grass seed every spring because the salt is tearing up the grass. That's not the kind of presence we are to have. We're supposed to have a good, positive, helpful presence. I felt like I just need to say that out loud in case that wasn't obvious to some. I've met people who say they don't know any nice church people. In fact, they expect a certain vibe from me because of their previous experience with other church people. And I generally try to confound those expectations. But I know what they're talking about. But it's still kind of perplexing to me because if church people are Jesus people, how can that be? How can it be? Somebody make it make sense to me how we got mean preachers who blame their meanness on the anointing. And scores of their followers say, well, you know, Apostle, he just, he just mean like that. I guess he's anointed. I, whoop, whoop, take, put some Bible on that. Where's that at? Because if your preachers mean, if your leaders are mean, I'm not talking about perfection here. I'm talking about a fundal, fundamental understanding that we are here primarily to represent Jesus. Verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds, good deeds, your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. Now, these good, this good that we're supposed to do, the good nature that we're supposed to show up with isn't for our glory. It's for the glory of God, the greater glory of God, and might I add, for the well-being of other people. People ought to be excited to see us coming. And sadly, sadly, Christians, especially after the last few years, are not experienced in our world as a helpful presence. We're not even experienced as a neutral presence. We can, because of politics, because of all the isms, because of how we've gotten in bed with things that we're not supposed to be in bed with, we can be perceived as harmful, as a nuisance, and it shouldn't be that way. When Christians show up, people should say, ah, help is here. Help has just walked through the door. When I show up someplace, I want people to go, help's here. 
because I know he's gone through everything he's got into this problem, into these people. He's going to show up as a helpful Christian presence. Like the gyms should be fighting for, the, for you, for, for your membership as a Christian. We want the Christians to work out here. Schools should be, please send us some Christian kids in the public schools. That's salt and light. Just give me some Christians because they, they're going to impact the atmosphere. They're going to shift the atmosphere because help comes when the Christian comes. The restaurants should say, look, I want Christians to come because they tip so good. <laughs> and you laugh because you know Christians are, they hate to see us coming on Sunday afternoon in our Sunday best. <laughs> Leaving the gospel track instead of a tip. Look, don't wear your SSV swag and, and, and don't tip, okay? Don't run the waitress ragged with your SSV shirt on. Love God, love people, live it out. Just don't do it. They don't want our kids on their sports teams because we shift the atmosphere, because we're different. In that helpful, hopeful way, we are called to be the answer. To be the answer. A helpful presence because that's what Jesus came to be. I want to be a helpful presence and minimally, I don't want to be a problem. Unless... Unless you're a system propping up systems of harm for other people, then you shouldn't want to see me coming. Not everybody wants to see help coming. If you're sticking up somebody, the last thing you want to see is help coming. If you're getting over on somebody, the last thing you want to see is help coming. And so I think it's worth saying that maybe not everybody ought to want to see the Christians coming. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, our lives are like Christ-like fragrances rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom, But to those who are being saved, we are what? A life-giving perfume, and who is adequate for such a task as this? Our presence in this world is good and helpful unless you're partnering with a system of darkness. Unless you're partnering with a system of darkness. Now, I can say this with credibility because lots of people love to see Jesus coming because of the healing that he brought, because of the messages that he brought, because he was a life-giving presence. The, 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 the kingdom had come, right? Oh, but his goodness often caused him to show up as a table-flipping Jesus. For those who wanted to operate in systems of darkness. Now notice I'm not talking about Jesus because I'm I'm not talking about people who are sinning. I'm not talking about people who are just, because that's really you and I, right? This isn't giving you ammunition to judge somebody. You're like, who do Pastor said I can flip some tables. You can't wait to get to work on Monday. I'm not talking about that. Because look, when help comes, the oppressors, they get big mad. Really mad. When liberation comes, the enslavers and the traffickers get upset because they know the jig is up. When any kind of supremacy and marginalization is on the table, that is a table that we've been given kingdom permission to what? To flip. 
He said, preacher, why are you saying this? Because I want to dispel the notion that Christians are supposed to just show up as some sort of Ned Flanders do-gooders. I think our good and our helpfulness will be actively pushing back against systems and realms of darkness, particularly that land on those who are underneath. I want you to sit with that for a second as you consider how you're supposed to show up as a presence in the world. And some of us have gotten so adjusted to the darkness, so cozy with these systems, especially if our skin color or if our social position allows us to benefit or minimally stay out of of dodge, why would we mess with it? But if we, as Jesus did, aimed himself at the broken, aimed himself at those who were poor in spirit, aimed himself at those who were needing mercy and a second chance, aimed himself at any system of darkness that tried to take advantage of people, he was always in trouble. But as the late John Lewis calls it, it was what? It was good trouble. It was good trouble. I guess I say all this to say that not everybody wants to see me coming. Because of what I've decided to give my life to. A portion of my calling is lifting up the underneath, even in our denomination, and making space and helping to set the table for different kind of folk. And I know when some people see me, they go, here it comes. He's going to be asking questions. He's going to be bringing more chairs to the table. This room going to get darker. But why am I at the table if I'm not... Why am I in the room? And so I hope you see me painting this dual picture of showing up as good, the fragrance of Christ that does good and helpful things, that intentionally rides the down escalator so that we might go and be a great presence to those who are down and out, who need help and who are hurting, both in our families and outside of the doors of our house, both in the church and outside the doors of our church, but we are also called to dismantle that which is dark and to be agents of constructive, helpful Christian light. This is who we're called to be. This is who we are, friends. Sadly, this isn't the life that most of us live. Right? And I don't say that to condemn you. I don't say that to to, to point a finger at you. I'm talking to us today. But this is the job. This is the Christian life. This is the good life. This is the blessed life. And my hope is that as you're sitting here, the weight of the Spirit is upon you, and rather than thinking about what you're going to have for lunch when you leave here, you are thinking about, do I show up this way in the rooms that I find myself in? And while this isn't an exhaustive list of the rooms you show up in, maybe some rooms that we all have in common are our home. Are you you the fragrance of Christ in your home? Are you the presence of the living God at home? Are you a noticeable, helpful presence in your house? And the room falls silent. 
Because if you're like me, you, you're, 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 you're probably on your worst behavior at home. Among the people who matter the most to you. They can get the scraps, can't they? You said, well, preacher, I just, I just get to be myself at home. Really? Yourself, what you're claiming as your identity is perpetually unpleasant to your family. The opposite of a Christ-like fragrance and presence, let, like, let that sit in before you justify it. A Christ-like presence at my job or my vocation. The worst kept secret is my Christian faith. Fragrance of God, the presence of Jesus in the marketplace. Do they know? Do they care? I get a little mocked at my gym. I do CrossFit in, the, in Chicago Heights, and, and, and they all, all, all kinds of preacher jokes all the time. And joke all you want, and, and it's, it's, it's loving, most of it. But they know I'm in the building. The instructors, even, they even play different music when the reverends. <laughs> and that's not because I'm making a stink about it. But like, they know I'm there. But there are also rooms in the marketplace of my life where I'd be content and just nobody knew. Maybe today I'm not feeling particularly Christian or I don't want to stand out in that way, right? Now we all can relate. And what I'm asking you is just to do the rundown of the rooms that you find yourself in regularly and ask yourself, if you are partnering with Jesus to change the world in meaningful, daily, seemingly mundane, seemingly excruciatingly small increments, are you the presence of Christ? That's the work you've got to do. That, I mean, those are questions that you have to answer. And so as we put this all together, and worship team, you can make your way back up. Three questions that I want to ask you to draw all this into sharper focus as we put this all together. The first is, are you living the blessed life? If, if you've forgotten already what I've talked about, go to Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. It spells it out there. It is a life, as we said, on the down escalator. And sometimes, as a pastor, I hear where people's prayer requests are. I, I, I regularly get brought in, into people's conversations with God as they ask me to partner with them. And so much of what people are asking for, they don't use this expression as, Lord, put me on the up escalator. People aren't asking me lots of times, Lord, help me to be, be more humble, to be more meek, to be more base, to fight for justice, to show up as an agent of righteousness, like people aren't regularly asking me to partner with them in those kinds of prayers. And sometimes I just want to say, what you're asking for isn't the life that God blesses, and frankly, he might not give that to you. Are, are, you, are you living or aspiring to live the blessed life, a life that is going downward? Second question is, are you a noticeable presence? And it's been my experience that this isn't a hard question for most people to answer. Because some of us give considerable effort to concealing our faith in Christian values. And so some of us, if we're honest, can answer this question very, very quickly. Are we a noticeable presence? Others of you might say, yes, I'm a noticeable presence but I'm not a noticeable presence for good. I'm not a helpful presence in the way that Christ 
not just asks, but demands that I show up in the world around me. Are you a helpful presence? At home, at work, at school, in the marketplace, are you a helpful presence? Now, I feel like I should say this again. If you're feeling uh, condemned right now, that's not from the Lord. But if you're feeling meaningfully convicted, that's probably the spirit of the living God. Not to just make you feel heavy, but because if he's put you with your family, and he has, he wants you to be the agent of his presence in that space. If he's put you on that job, though you may not like it, he's put you there to be an agent of his presence at that job. If he's sent you to that gym or sent you to that school, or if you choose to shop at the Meyer or the Jewel or the Waltz, he's got you there specifically as his inside man, his inside woman. If we're to be the presence, our faith has to be the worst kept secret in our lives. Do we live that way? If your answer is no, one, you're in good company. Two, you don't have to leave the way you came. And so as we stand, and you can stand if you can, and we worship today, would you just pray the prayer of the psalmist David who says, search me, O God. Show me myself. Help me to show up like you want me to show up. Help me partner with you, Lord, in changing the world. I know that sounds like a superhero kind of thing, but it's really, it's really quite a, it's really a manageable task if you lean into it on a daily basis. So Lord, as we worship you today, we ask you to search us. And as we situate ourselves in the midst of a holiday season that could churn up all kinds of family mess, all kinds of issues. Father, would you help us to be the fragrance of Christ wherever we go. Our life is yours. Our hope is in you. May we partner with you to change the world. Come Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name.